So um, I told him I was gonna make me do that. I was gonna call you, mm -hmm. but I, I got so busy. Yeah, I stopped by and saw him last week. Did you? Yeah. So we can do that one day when I leave. Exactly, it was my brother. Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. As usual, I want to make sure that I, I get it out there, that I want you vets to get out there and sign up for your benefits. It's very, very, very important, especially those Vietnam vets and it's a very, very important situation because many, many are kind of like living on the possibility of welfare or whatever. So get out there and, and get registered. And for you family members, get your, get your grandpas and your, and your dads and whatever and get them out there and get them certified. Okay, fine. With that note, hey, we're going to have quite a show today. Uh, we're fortunate again to, to have uh, someone that you've seen before. Gentleman by the name of Baruti uh, Atari, who sits is here on my on my right, but on your left on the screen aspect of it, and we're going to take the opportunity to kind of uh, get, get you know this guy has been very very much involved, very active if you will, uh, in 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 his endeavors from the private sector to the to the government section to uh, I mean just across the board, and uh, I mean that was an issue with reference to uh, uh, the, the other issue that was that I've we've done short short pieces on in regards to this whole issue of uh, Roy J and the, and the, the issues along that particular line. We're going to discuss that also, too, but we're going to do that probably in the next half hour. But the first half hour, we're going to take the opportunity, especially during these times, an opportunity to get sort of an update on the, on the state of Oregon. I'll put it that way, on the yeah. state of Oregon, if you will. And actually, we're not going to show maybe a lot of the communique uh, we'll probably be talking about uh, in this particular area because a lot of folks want to know what's happening in the minority community, so to speak, and what does that mean, the minority community? We've gone through affirmative action, we've gone this, and this, that, and the other, and all due respect, we're going to take advantage of this because this gentleman has been out there in those areas, i.e. looking at those kind of situations, both from the private sector and as a government official aspect of it, and so we're going to take advantage of that, and then just any comments he might want to make, like we did before. Rudy, welcome. How you doing? Good. Man? Thank you very much, Sounds sir. Great. Appreciate that very much. You. All right. Good. Uh, good. Very glad to be back good, good, with you. Good, I appreciate good. this opportunity, and as always, I thank you, uh, Portland Community Media, for this chance. And I just think it's so important for the community to have avenues like this to get information out to the public, uh, to share what's not being reported good, good, in the ma major newspapers and some of the other media good. out there. Appreciate. It. Let's give a little quick kudo to Jerome Kersey. I'm sure you oh, you yes. saw him play. Just just a brief little quick little brief kudo to yes. Jerome Kersey. Real very very outstanding guy. Very community oriented with the Portland Drail Blazer right away. Any yeah. just quick comments? Well, well, yeah, and I think most of your viewing audience would know that Jerome played with the Blazers. Uh, he was a star, and he retired here in the community after playing for a number of different teams. Uh, was a fixture in the community in terms of working on behalf of the Trail Blazers and someone who, who was a humble person and also very active. Uh, I had a chance for, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years, I served on the Trail Blazer Community Advisory Board and had a chance to work with the various presidents and general managers about the team. And we would often go back and reminisce about the era of Jerome Kersey and Clyde Drexler yep. and Terry Porter. Mm -hmm. and, and my issue was character, you know, yeah. making sure that we're bringing character to the city. And, mm -hmm. and so a lot of the changes you saw happen right after the trail blazers who were called the jail blazers. Yeah, right, and, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, some of that was getting a lot yeah. of discussion by mm -hmm. Steve Patterson, who was then president, Larry Miller, who came in uh, after him, and, and I was able to participate. And I was always very straight up in terms of, you know, it didn't matter, you know, how good these guys were, that we don't need to have characters that are detrimental to the community mm -hmm. and be negative role models. So I'm, I'm just... Uh, proud to say that Jerome Kersey, from what I could see and what I knew, was an upstanding person, had great character, uh, represented the organization well. Uh, he was 52 years old, as, as you know, and he passed yeah. something to do with a blood clot. And yeah. it just continues to point out the fact, you know, that we never know what's going to happen right. in life. Life is short. And, and again, it relates back to some of the reasons I came on your show. Mm -hmm. I said, I need to just go ahead and tell the truth about some things that are going on in the community because you have to get it out there. But I would also say say in terms of losing Jerome Kersey who was an outstanding trailblazer uh, my 
buddy who passed, Maurice Lucas, was another outstanding mm-hmm. trailblazer. And, and I, I was just so shocked, you know, when I think about the deaths yeah, of different young people. And, and especially you see people who were who were athletes, you know, yeah, who were healthy and prime. And these people, through various circumstances, you know, they pass on, they're gone. So some of the rest of it, it just encourages us to do what we need to do to take right. care of ourselves mentally, right. physically, and spiritually. Right. Kudos to that. I'm sure everyone there would respect that also, too. Okay, good. Now, let's get into, again, like I said, when I started off by saying taking advantage of it to get you some, get some feedback or, or your response to some of the activities that have been happening of late, the election, uh, the marijuana situation, uh, the, the recent governor's race, that, that kind of a situation, um, you know, the, the new police chief that we've mm-hmm. got here now. Um, this is Black History Month. Yeah. I want to make sure, folks, this yes. is Black History Month, and this is my Black History Month show. Yeah. Okay, yes. so and I'm, and I'm fortunate that we're fortunate, if you will, to have Baruti Artari to respond to that because he, mm-hmm. as far as I'm concerned, he, when you look at his background, like I said before, this guy was in, in the private sector aspect. We got Providence, and and you you've got the housing authority. You got the housing, I mean, state housing authority. State housing. And yes. You got PDC Port and Development Commission, and you know that's that is a hotbed. Yeah. I mean, for someone to take on that task. That was quite a bit. So, so just your reflection on some of those areas. Well, Bruce, I, again, I appreciate the invitation. And, and it was last year in February during the month of Black History that I came on your show and uh, started talking about a number of things going on in the community. And I like what you said, that uh, Black history is American history. Yes, you know, right. Oftentimes right. it's right. left out. Uh, sometimes it's distorted, but it's just part of American history. So even as I talk about the issues that impact our community, I'm always looking at how does it impact us, one, as uh, African Americans in the community, but also in the context of the larger discussion yes. and the yes. larger community, because who and what we are is interwoven so much into yes. the fabric of the society at large. And so I'll give you a, a, a couple of updates that, that uh, <laughs> have stayed on my mind, because uh, I did several shows last year for anyone who might be viewing and we talked about a lot of deep issues but I haven't been very vocal or public over the last nine months or so because I've been taking care of my personal business and family and all that but I've also been listening and observing in terms of what's going on in the Mm -hmm. community and some things I just continue to see to be very very outrageous and those are the things that drive me to uh, come back and continue to speak up and I'll start down my list Uh, the very first one was you ran for Multnomah County Commissioner and uh, as well as three other people ran for Multnomah County Commission. And I was very taken back the way the media reported post-election and how the results of that election happened. And there were several things that, that just really stayed with me. The first one is I was surprised when we start to hear from the media and some people in the community were questioning the fact that we've got four African Americans running for the same position in the, at the county. And I was taken back because it was as though that we are so monolithic as mm-hmm. a people that if we can get one person, that person is going to represent all of us. And when I sat back and I looked at the four people who were running, uh, starting with yourself, someone who who is a senior, someone who has a military background, someone who is a business owner, uh, someone who's been doing development in this community. So you bring a whole set of life experiences to the discussion about the issues that are facing us that's different than somebody else. Mm-hmm. Then you take a step back. Uh, you had Teresa Rayford running. And, and I was shocked because here she is, uh, first she's a mother, She's been an activist in the community for years. She had ran for Portland City Council before, uh, and she was a former business owner. And she has continued since that election to be involved in the community, and now she's leading the effort of Portland, uh, don't shoot Portland, don't shoot PDX. And I think she's continued to demonstrate her leadership skills, her her passion uh, for this community, But when the media saw that she was running, I was so taken back because the media report was, oh, she's running because Baruti and or Bruce may have put her up to it. And I thought that so much diminished who she is as a person, her background, her experience. And it was just cut to this little soundbite. She's doing this. And it was like it was an emotional decision on her part. But she, too, she ran an African-American woman. And then you had the third person, uh, Mr. Kelvin Hall, who is a father in the 
the community with, I think, three or four kids in Portland Public Schools, a criminal justice major uh, in school. Yeah, they, they, uh, yeah, yeah he may be it. working on a PhD, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but he has a master's. And he's, yeah. he's been doing a very lot of stuff in the yeah. community, and very education. active uh, with the Albina Ministerial Alliance uh, uh, for uh, justice and police yeah. reform. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing. So people on the outside in the media said, oh, we got four black people. And they could not see past that. And I was shocked. And so I took a step back and I said, if you were to take away the fact that the four of you, and then you have Loretta Smith was the incumbent, the fourth right. person. But if you take away the fact that we had four black people running and didn't say they were black, you've got four individuals with very unique perspectives, very unique experience, and very different approaches on how they saw the position, how they would reach out to the community. But again, because of the media and some folks in the community, they didn't want to recognize that all they could see is, oh, they're black. Mm -hmm. and, and and that stuck in my craw. That, that just really stuck in my craw because everybody was unique uniquely qualified uh, in order to run for the position. Mm -hmm. And then after the election, here's the <laughs> other thing. They said, oh, Commissioner Loretta Smith wins by a landslide. She got 70% of the vote. Mm -hmm. And again, this is one of those things, is the glass half full or is it half empty? <laughs> now, if you go back to the election, nobody even announced they were going to run against her until about four months before the election itself. And so in, in a period of about four months, she essentially went from, uh, my perspective is, she had 100% of the vote because there were no challenges. Nobody was questioning uh, the job she was doing. Nobody was questioning uh, 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 what she was doing. The comments weren't being made that she's a photo op commissioner, that she's taking pictures, but what has she done? Uh, people were questioning her judgment, her integrity, based on the situation that happened with me. Uh, people were questioning uh, the people around her, who she was working with. So in a very short period of time, and some of it was directly a result of comments made on this show mm -hmm. is that she lost 30% of the votes in her district mm -hmm. in four months. Mm -hmm. And so the media will spin that and say, oh, she went by last night, she had <laughs> 70%. But it wasn't until a short time, again, before the election, people started saying, wait a minute, something's wrong here. We can do better than this. We need to have alternatives. We need mm -hmm. to get some issues on the table. Mm -hmm. So I commend uh, Teresa, I commend Kelvin Hall for stepping up, I commend you for stepping up and say that, you know, we have a right to have candidates out there and we should never be so hung up that we say that we can't run against each other, right, we can't right. compete, exactly. and people shouldn't have options. Mm -hmm. And so, and it, again, the whole media thing, you've heard me talk about this before <laughs> because of my own personal experience. I was so frustrated uh, uh, when I went through my uh, ordeal with the media because what I saw with the media was that they were not using the same journalistic standards when it came to issues involving the African-American community as they use for some of the larger mm -hmm. issues involving the majority community. Mm -hmm. And so I saw and I continue to see in the media that when it comes to African-Americans, sometimes it's the language, it's the wording, you know, it's, it's how we get uh, portrayed. And, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it's the media who becomes the judge, the jury, and yeah. the executioner. Yeah. Yeah. Because in the eyes of the public, once they write it and they say it, whether it's true or not, then you become convicted. You know, you get convicted of that. And so it's the same thing. And, uh, and so what happens, and obviously the thing that happens in the community is people love to get a salacious story. If it's something involving uh, uh, a sexism or racism, you know, people just jump all over that. Again, whether the facts are correct or not. Uh, and I also I take a step back. You know, you mentioned earlier about the uh, governor's resignation, yep, yep. and that's the thing that's been in the news lately oh, uh, here in Oregon. Uh, our governor has resigned under various investigations and uh, uh, a lot of allegations being made, and and the media is just all over that. I mean, mm -hmm. every twist and turn, every angle, and and I. I I, I love the reporting. I love getting the information and the facts out, but sometimes it's just overboard. Yeah. And it becomes, you know, just a assassination. And, and the media, they're constantly trying to outdo each other in terms of, of who can write uh, the most uh, uh, controversial story, uh, who can therefore get the most hits on their website, who can get uh, the readership. So it's all about, and I think, 
It's just about getting the information out there and, and getting the website hits and, and all of that. And it becomes less about let's get the facts and the truth out. Because I, yes. again, and I say this from personal experience, because I know when I went to the media based on some things that were reported about me, I said, well, let me tell you the whole story. Let me give you the they facts. And they told me, oh, no, we're not they even interested, interested in that. They already got you know, the story. Yeah, yeah. They didn't want the backstory <laughs> yeah, behind it. They just, want it. they just wanted to run with it. So, so I, I, I feel you. that that was something. And you can tie that into this whole issue, too. You know, uh, when I came in February of last year, that was prior to the whole Ferguson shooting issue that happened with Mike Brown. It was prior to the national uh, uh, media looking a lot at the issue of, of the treatment of young African Americans by the police bureau. And so that whole thing has kind of snowballed. Mm -hmm. But it's so interesting, though, because as I say, history continues to repeat itself. And when I was on this show, I was talking about how the media deals with us as African Americans. And and I watch the national news, the media play out, and you see the same thing getting played out over and over again. Whenever there's a situation where an African American is a victim, the way they are portrayed, the comments they get made, and all that, and and, and it's it's just very very sad. And uh, and then and then here locally in Portland, uh, and, you know, it's it's the issue of we have all these. Uh, so-called liberal, progressive mm -hmm. white people here mm -hmm. who want to come in and save the world and often feel like they know better uh, than we do of what's best for our community, what's best for our people. And if we're not willing to yield and let them do that, then they turn and want to make us uh, the the subject of their ire and that we're the problem mm -hmm. but but I think that's very unfortunate because it ties right back to the media and it ties because here's what happens is you got all these liberal uh, progressive folks out there and a lot of them don't have relationships yeah. with people of color especially African Americans and so they develop a few relationships here and there with one or two people that becomes their pipeline mm -hmm. into the community the mm -hmm. pipeline into our culture uh, pipeline into who and what we are are, so what they hear and see from that pipeline, they take that to be the world. And, and there's nothing really wrong with that, but nobody can speak for a whole race. But the sad part is when you have some of these people who are considered to be pipelines, mm -hmm. uh, they are self-motivated. They're only looking out for their self-interest. Mm -hmm. And they're not really uh, telling the truth and putting the facts out there. And so as a result, again, we see in the local media, a lot of times things get reported and we got one or two, I use the term house Negroes who mm -hmm. are there feeding information to the media mm -hmm. and they're feeding it with a slant and it's skewed to whatever may be in their own personal self-interest. And I feel bad because I think Again, some of these white folks are well-intentioned, but they're gullible. They mm -hmm. eat this up, and they mm -hmm. said, "Oh God, oh, this is something we can take and we can run with it." You know, we can make make some make hay out of this, and it could be all wrong, totally mm -hmm. wrong. And that goes back again to the journalistic standards that are mm -hmm. so important with the media. If somebody's getting reported on an issue, the questions they get asked. Mm -hmm. I had a chance to go back and look at the first show I came on, mm -hmm. and, and I had to smile myself because I couldn't believe I was so passionate. You know, yeah, I was actually, yeah. you know, I said oh, yeah. I was upset. I was very oh, yeah. angry oh, yeah. oh, because yeah. I had been a victim of a drive-by, a yes, political right. drive-by. Right. And I don't know. I think most people out in the audience viewing this would be just as upset too if somebody tried to take oh, you out and yeah. they miss. It. You oh, know, yeah. you would be upset about yeah, it. Right. And so I came off very passionate and very strong in the first one or two shows that I was on, and. I went back and I looked at that and I said, you know, that uh, that's what happens because we've got certain people that are working against the interests of the community. But at the same time, they're selling themselves on doing work on behalf of the community. Mm -hmm. So the gullible white people, uh, they get on board and they eat it up. And, and recently I saw a quote I have to contribute to uh, Malcolm X. It was so good. I actually posted this on my Facebook. It was so good. It said, if you're not careful, the newspapers will have you loving the people who are oppressing you and hating the people that are being oppressed. <laughs> and, and again, history continues to repeat itself. Yeah, it yeah, can, yeah, continues to repeat yeah, itself. Yeah, yeah. So, so those are some of the things, Bruce, you asked about Measure but, 91. But, but before you get off that media piece, mm -hmm. let's make sure we, we're very clear about the fact, I was waiting, if you will, after we've had, we were having those discussions about your particular issue for, if you will, the, the, the minority media 
-hmm. if you will, to jump in on the free in mm -hmm. terms of i.e. defining what you were saying or giving you the same opportunity. Yeah. But that didn't happen. So my point is yeah. all inclusive. Understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But there's a reason for that too. Yeah. Because they're well, trying to stay in business too. Yeah. And 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 I and I know when you speak of the uh, I'm not trying minority, to be, you're saying the African American newspapers, the Portland Observer, Port Observer and the Scanner, the scanner. Yeah, right? Uh, and the Asian Light. Reporter, and yeah. I mean, you know, the only Hispanic. I mean, I'm just I'm throwing yeah. them all, but more specifically the African American news because you happen yeah. to be an sure. African American. Yeah. I thought sure they would have jumped on board and given you the spread mm -hmm. to articulate your position that you shared here because yeah. you had more time here. Yeah. My point. They had yeah. they had the piece to edit and all yeah. this. I'll call well, you in and yeah. Uh, and, and I'll share my thoughts uh, with both of the. And papers. I'm not trying to. Because yeah. one of the things I said early on when this happened, as you know, I said I just wasn't talking to the media, the right, press, right, or anybody because right, right. things were being reported and it was so distorted. Right. I felt like anything I said was going to be twisted and used against me. And plus, I was I was worked up. I probably yeah. would have said yeah. some wrong things yeah. too. Yeah. And so 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 it was my initial uh, reaction was just not talk to right. anybody. Mm -hmm. But then as after I left the mayor's office and this story, uh, this story started to really gel and become more focused, I, there's two things, two comments I would give with you. Uh, number one, uh, you know, I have no issue with either newspaper right, because right, they've right, been right. supportive of me and supportive of the community. But I would say with the Scanner newspaper that uh, Bernie Foster, who's the owner, publisher, uh, he could write an editorial about what happened to me mm -hmm. because he was there that night mm -hmm. and 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 he could at any time write an editorial about this is what I saw this is my perspective and and that's up to him he may even eventually that been okay. do that one day but yeah. it been okay yeah. but I think it, it should have been done it would have been yeah. a good thing yeah. for the community at large in yeah. terms, and in what the majority community expect if you will mm -hmm. of the African American newspaper yeah. you know what I'm saying yes yeah to kind of so, give them a feel for yeah. what, what's and, going and, on and again I can't speak to why that didn't yeah. happen but or hey. why it didn't touch but I just want to make sure that I throw that out on the table Table. But I also want to come over to the Portland Observer because okay. the scanner, again, you know, uh, Bernie, and he, again, he may step up, he may write an editorial. I don't see him being oh, yeah. bashful on most issues, most subjects, yeah, no, and yeah, he'll yeah. speak up. And, yeah. and I've supported him for years. I continue to support him whether he writes an editorial or not. Yeah. Uh, the Portland Observer, though, it's been very <laughs> interesting, though, uh, because I can share with you what other people have pointed out to me. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, and people can speculate. But uh, they have been on a kick since this whole story came out to promote Mr. Roy J. Harris. You yeah. know, every week the paper come out, they're promoting him, promoting his picture, trying to say good things about him and all of that. And I've had other people in the community come to me and say, Baruti, did you see this? Yeah. Baruti, did you see this? Baruti, what's the deal between Roy J. Harris and the Portland Observer that they are just bending over backwards to make him look like, uh, you know, like he is the savior of our community? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, people can speculate, uh, but it's 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 sad to think that we would have any media that is less than objective mm -hmm. on what they're reporting. And 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 folks have said, you know, that uh, you know one's reporting shouldn't be tied to uh, the advertising dollars. You know, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that it, that if, if if you support me financially, I'll say some good things about you. You know, and, and that's not that's not journalism. So mm -hmm. so the Observer, I've been a little bit more disappointed in. And at one time, uh, I think there was some consideration to uh, uh, writing something about this situation that we've been talking about, right, right. Uh, about the political drive-bys, about the nonprofit fraud uh, uh, that has been alleged by you know, a dozen people around mm -hmm. town about the investigation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and leading up to a potential article, I was asked to come and sit down for a meeting uh, with the uh, the owners or publisher of the newspaper because they wanted to talk about what would the story be about. And I was very taken back because uh, it's either like you're going to do a story, you're not going right, to do a right, story. Right, right. But it's like, well, let us screen what you're going to say yeah. and see if that pass mustered in order for us to print it. And I just said, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about it. And I just left it alone. Well, you know, the fun thing about what you just said, that th those pieces that those interviews that you did here was emailed to them so they had all the mm -hmm. time to, to basically play it over and over mm -hmm. and and uh, vet whatever you said if you will find out if they were truth or non truth and whatever mm -hmm. and then hey there it is you know and, and if in fact if they found something to be just like they did with the governor situation they could have really jumped on it yeah. and had a fun yeah and, and, and you use a very important term about vetting information yeah. Yeah. and this is something I, I this is another reflection over the last year you know when I came on in February and March of last year, I came out uh, yeah. with facts, yeah. with uh, names, yeah. and I said, from my perspective, 
this was a political drive-by. Here's why. Here's mm -hmm. the people who were involved. Here's what I believe to be their motivations. Mm -hmm. And I just laid it all out there. And, and at the end, I challenged anybody, said, if I read the situation wrong, if I misinterpreted anything, somebody let me know. To this day, Bruce, a year later, not a single person has. I would have thought that Willamette Week would have taken it. I mean, Jack, you know, what's, what's this guy's name? Jack, what's his name? Nigel Jakes. Nigel was, Jakes. You yeah, know, I, yeah. I thought sure he was going to jump on this particular issue. Well, but I sent this piece to him. Well, well, well. As I said, very first, important piece yeah, for the yeah, community yeah, at yeah. large. You got my well, point. Well, the, the one thing, as I said, in, in a year, not a single person has come to me, wow. questioned my wow. perception of my perspective as I reported, because I gave the facts and the truth as I truly understood them. And if I had uh, inaccurately commented on somebody, yeah. I, and they brought it to my attention, I would have been the first to correct that, but mm -hmm. not a single person. So that says a lot right there. But the deal with Willamette Week, as you know, they were the first persons who came out with this salacious story about Baruti harassing Loretta yeah. at this event. Another black person. Yeah, yeah, another black person, a black <laughs> man calling the yeah, black, black woman, woman beautiful, yeah. Oh, yeah. and oh, yeah. that sexual yeah. harassment, yeah. how could you do this? Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, and I'm like, well, wait a minute, you know, one, you know, as I said, they didn't ask questions. I, I couldn't believe it. And, and this is one thing I didn't say that I thought about is if, if Nigel Jaquist wanted to cut to the, the back story on this very quick, there's just a few very basic questions he could have asked Loretta mm -hmm. uh, and, and it would have shed some light on what was going on. He could ask her one question and say, well, what other elected officials were in the room when this happened? Mm -hmm. And the answer would have been none because no elected officials were even invited to this reception. <laughs> it was a very conscious decision between the Office of Equity, the Skinner newspaper who was a sponsor, and the mayor's office that we did not want this to be uh, a political showcase and have people standing on their laurels. We wanted this to be a real base down the earth community discussion. So we did not invite a single elected official to this. So Nigel could have asked, well, what other elected officials were there? Oh, mm -hmm. there were none. Oh, well, how did you end up there? Who invited you? Mm -hmm. How did you find out about it? Mm -hmm. Because the other thing that we'll and you would have we, said, and you would have yeah, said, well, well, and I don't, I don't have a speculation. I don't know how she got there. No, in terms of how you got there. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, well. For me, I was one of the organizers. Right, you know, right, I was right. Okay. Plan the okay. event. You know, I was there because I was asked with, through the mayor's office, the office of equity, and the scanner. We were putting on this event to give a report to the community on the progress being made in the city of Portland. Office makes of equity. sense. Yeah, because there's been some misunderstandings right, out there. Right, Good right. intention, right. and the program went well. Everything mm -hmm. was fine, and so so Loretta wasn't on the invitation list. She uh, uh, was not expected to be there. And so at the time she walked in, out of common courtesy, as I've done ever since I've worked for two governors in the state legislature, I go out of my way to acknowledge elected officials because I know how hard it is to be an elected official. And so when she came in, before I passed mic or moved on to the next point I was going to make, I just wanted to acknowledge her and give her what we do in our community, give her a shout out, yeah, oh yeah, you know, just oh give yeah, her a oh shout yeah, out. Oh yeah. And so, but Nigel, he didn't ask that question. Uh, and to my knowledge, and, and, and the other part I said too, in one of the other shows is that uh, before I ever got the phone call from the reporter, I had four other people call me, said they had been contacted and they all said, they told them nothing happened, nothing was there. But none of that was reflected in the reporting that mm. took place. Interesting. Uh, and then, as the story got reported, and this is the other part too, this ties back to the governor's resignation. This is the other thing that I learned. Nigel Jaquist is the reporter at Will Lambeth Week who broke the story on the former mayor of Portland, Neil Goldsmith, having raped uh, uh, a preteen mm -hmm. girl, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and for years that was going on. And, and so that got to be big news. I think he may have got a, a poor surprise oh, right, for that yeah, story. Yeah, and so it's yeah, yeah. so all of a sudden, you know, uh, he yeah. became the man, what he writes, everybody looks at. Mm -hmm. And then he turned around and the Sam Adams piece happened. Yep, I remember that one. And then he gets some inside scoop on Sam Adams, having had relationship with a 17 year old boy and all of this. And that gets reported. So Nigel's out there and even most recently with the governor. And you kept know? their jobs, by the way. Yeah, yeah, but he, but but even most recently with the whole resignation <laughs> the of yeah, our governor, yeah, yeah, Nigel yeah, was out there yeah, reporting on the guy, governor's yeah, um, yeah. Uh, uh, fiance and what was going on. So it's out there. So this is what I realized. I said, oh, so if Nigel's name or byline is on a story, 
everybody perks up, yeah, you know, because, yeah. oh, this is something that could yeah. be good. This is going to be deep. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, so when my little piece came out and Baruti called Loretta beautiful, oh, that's sexual harassment. And that was about the extent of it. But because he said it and was in Will Lambeth Week, the news media went crazy. The other newspapers, oh, we're getting scooped again by Nigel. We need to find something. <laughs> they start turning over everything mm -hmm. they could mm -hmm. in terms of we got to find the dirt because mm -hmm. we don't mm -hmm. want Nigel to scoop us any more than they have. And so they did all of that. And they came back and said, oh, well, he's got some unpaid parking tickets and he's involved in a lawsuit with an attorney. Those were the two things they came yeah. back with. And I and I and I said back uh, because because, uh, as I said, I went to some of the medians. Let me give you some of the rest of the story. And at that point, they said, no, no, we don't want to do that. And one of them actually told me that we got scooped by Will Amoth Week. So we going back. We're looking at all of the uh, legal filings. We're looking at public records. We're trying to find anything we can, because, mm -hmm. again, you know, Nigel has kind of served you up. Mm -hmm. without really the facts and so we want to continue to do our part get to, our piece to bash you to get our piece <laughs> in and then make sure there's anything else and and, and, and then the yeah. part that i'm sitting back because i'm saying well damn you know say i have you know uh having grown up where i grew up you know i it ain't that i'm perfect i've been a saint but through the jobs that i've had with uh, uh in the political arena through the contracting i've done as an entrepreneur with the department of defense uh I've had backgrounds done by Homeland Security, uh, by the FBI, uh, you know, the city of Portland Police and par uh, Department, the city attorney's office. And I've had all these background checks, you know, so so it's not like I've got anything to hide. And so if you so that's as a result, they say, well, we're going to take this one comment. He called somebody beautiful. Oh, God, that's sexual harassment. Oh, he got some unpaid parking tickets. Oh, oh, yeah. And the fact, oh, yeah, he's got a lawsuit. So that's what they wanted to make that my life story instead of the 40 years plus of service and work that I've done in the community. As I said before, none of that was ever mentioned. None of it mentioned, here's what his background is. And that's the other thing. As a reporter, I would think if someone had been decades of community service, no allegations, nothing like mm -hmm, this has ever mm -hmm. happened, no criminal record, nothing else like that. Somebody makes an allegation like this, instead of just jumping on it and accepting it at face value, that's the time to start asking some questions, do some background checking, has this happened before? And none of that, it was just taken, and let's run with this. And you know, and, and so I was very disappointed. Well, that. bottom line, as you said, this was a drive-by, mm -hmm. and you don't take those other things in consideration, mm -hmm. you understand? Drive-by. Yeah. On that particular note, we're going to take a break on this drive-by situation, <laughs> and we'll come right back with Mr. Baruti. We'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back, folks. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host here at the Oregon Voters Digest. We're again, we're, this is Black History Month, and our featured guest is uh, Baruthi Archery. And uh, this has been just great. If you've missed the show, you know, you can pick it up later on, or if not that, you can pick it up on YouTube, okay? Now, on this particular segment, we're just going to continue on with reference to uh, his, his, you know, some response in regards to some of the issues that are, that are at, at impacting here in Oregon. And one of the biggest issues is that of the whole issue of police. You know, police is kind of like from a national perspective aspect mm -hmm. of it. The Ferguson thing and this, you can go on and on and on. It's big, it's big stuff right now. But here in the Portland area, in Oregon, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, whenever you start thinking about um, uh, IE, uh, the whole issue of police and gangs and this, that, and the other, it's always tend to identify with African Americans mm -hmm. aspect of it. And there was a big case here, the Havana Middle Storylines basically brought this issue up to the table, and et cetera, et cetera. So it got down to the point where the Justice Department got in. I'm just doing a quickie piece. Justice mm -hmm. Department came in and basically sat down with the city of Portland, gave them some sense, some guidelines, if you will, and now they've got a program. Uh, so we're going to see if uh, uh, Baruti mm -hmm. here will kind of give us a little feedback. And you can go back in history if you want to or whatever, okay, sure. and how you got involved in that whole process. Mm -hmm. Then there's the mayor's situation who basically picked you basically to oversee that piece for him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just throwing that out to you. 
Just, just, okay. just jump yeah. right on yeah. in there, great. please. Okay. Great. And, and, and again, just for the sake of some of your viewers who right. may not know some of the background, uh, 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 I retired from the mayor's office. My position was policy advisor to the mayor. Uh, my area was public safety. I served as the mayor's liaison to the Portland Police Bureau, uh, a bureau with about a thousand officers. Uh, and in that role, it put me in the position to be involved in working with the mayor and advising him on the Department of Justice settlement that was okay. being proposed in response to the investigation. Yeah. Uh, uh, the city of Portland uh, had been found at fault by the U.S. Department of Justice for using excess uh, force when it came to dealing with the mentally ill community. Uh, there was a major push to also uh, find that uh, excess force was being used with people of color in the community, especially African Americans. But that was not one of the rulings, one of the findings. So when I arrived in the mayor's office, uh, this settlement was being negotiated. Uh, it was being worked out. Uh, there was a list of recommendations that the Department of Justice had put forward to the city of Portland, uh, what they needed to do to improve uh, the training of officers, uh, the recruitment, the hiring, uh, how to deal with the mentally ill community. And so, so in my role, I was able to help to start to advance uh, actions as it related to some of those recommendations. And during the time that I was there, uh, the areas that I take great pride in, in in my time when I was there is that, number one, uh, I had the opportunity to have major input on the police budget uh, at that time. And it was during the time when the city of Portland was facing a $21 million deficit in the uh, general fund. So there were a lot of drastic cuts having to be made across the board. And in the police bureau, uh, there were a lot of proposals of things to be cut. But one area of the budget that I felt passionate about, it was dealing with the school resource officers. Mm -hmm. And those are the police officers assigned to our middle schools and high schools mm -hmm. that are on the ground, not there to arrest people, but there to work with the kids, to prevent problems, to be responsive if there is a serious situation. And I had had the opportunity uh, while in the mayor's office to get to know the school resource offices, going on ride-alongs with them, visiting the school. And I said, this is the type of preventive work we need to do on the front side mm -hmm. so we're not on the back side mm -hmm. looking at how do we track down the gang members and lock them up. And so I supported that. And fortunately, the mayor accepted that. And, and, uh, and the uh, school resource office maintained um, a lot of their resources and the officers in the school. And the other area that was real important is that the issue of training. Uh, we realized that the training needed to be improved for our police officers. They needed to start to learn how to de-escalate situations instead of escalating situations when they came on the scene. And so I was able to participate with the uh, people in charge of training and to uh, 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 look at some of our policies and some of the changes, the recommendations uh, on how we approach people in the mentally ill community uh, and, and was involved in the early stages of helping the police department get a new training facility built. Mm -hmm out by the Portland yeah. Airport, and they have that. And we have uh, uh, an opportunity now where officers can go in to, uh, as almost real life situations and, and be able to train and interact and all that. The other thing that I, I really was passionate about is the area of police discipline. You know, we've had a history in this city and probably a lot of other police departments, uh, the perception of police officers not being held accountable when they do things wrong. And so on behalf of the mayor, I'd sit in on all the police discipline hearings. So when they were brought up, uh, uh, complaints by citizens, uh, uh, violations of policies and rules. Is that I, an example that you may have? Uh, uh, one that comes to mind is, uh, I guess, was it an officer or something that had posted this deal out on a... On a yeah. well, Oh, okay. Um, if you uh, don't mind. Okay. Well, that was one that actually happened before I came aboard. Before you came aboard. But let right, me come okay. back to that because okay. I'll, I'll come back to mind. that. Yeah. yeah. I'll talk some. That's what, that's what sort of comes out of my mind. Yeah, because part of my role is to, uh, would have been to advise the mayor on situations like, like that. that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And so, so my advice, it was, again, it was on the budget, it was on training, it was on mm -hmm. police discipline. And I, I take also a lot of pride in, in helping to have input uh, to the police chief on promotions, making sure that we have diversity in how we get promoted, making sure we've got women and people of color in strategic positions of command. And, and I feel good that with the mayor's support that the chief was uh, uh, willing to definitely support 
support some of those recommendations. And as a result, uh, you know, we had who was then Captain Modica became Commander Modica and and now he's uh, Assistant Chief Modica. And I feel a lot of pride because uh, as I got to know him, I felt this was somebody who was African-American, the most senior person in the police department, and he needed to have broader responsibilities. And, and I feel good that, that that happened. And then lastly was the whole area of community outreach that when I came in, uh, there was tension uh, with the Albina Ministerial Alliance for uh, uh, justice and police reform and working with the Portland Police Bureau over a number of issues. And the one big one was we were looking at uh, the police psychologist who screens the applicants before they come into the police bureau. And concerns by the AMA was that they had used the same guy and people were not sure he was culturally sensitive. So I was able to get involved and work with uh, uh, the Human Resources Department and the Police Department, the Procurement Department with the City of mm. Portland, mm. worked with the AMA. We had community meetings and, and we were able to work through that and was able to reach some resolution. So I say all that to say that mm -hmm. uh, what perspective I have on some of these broader issues, mm. it comes from one, yeah. being a citizen on the outside right. and, uh, uh, and two, having had the opportunity to work on the inside. Now, the particular incident that you were referring to, I, I think probably uh, what that ties to is that was uh, Captain Kruger, who had posted uh, some type of a Nazi monument yeah, in one yeah. of the city parks here, right. and he had received discipline for that some years back. Uh, and then last year, another situation came up that he was involved in. And as part of the settlement, um, there was an agreement made to go back into his files and to remove this letter of discipline as it related to the Nazi monument. Uh, he was actually, you know, paid out a little bit of money. And, and, and this was a decision that was made. I don't know if it went before the entire Portland City Council or not, but when it became public, there was a major outcry. Oh, yeah, especially the Jewish community. Yeah, yeah, from the city of Portland. It's yeah. like, how could you let this guy yeah. off the hook over yeah, this? Yeah, right. And, and, and for me, when I look at that, uh, the thing that I think about in some of the internal workings uh, that when recommendations like that are, are being made as it has to do with discipline, you've got the attorney's office involved in reviewing this. They're discussing it. They're meeting with the mayor's office. Uh, you have the command staff of the police bureau who would be involved in looking at this and making uh, recommendations. Uh, you have the uh, various discipline boards who are taking a look at this. And then you have within the mayor's office, you have policy advisors mm -hmm. whose job is to screen this type of stuff and make sure you're doing the right thing. So, so while I uh, was surprised at that, that it happened, I just felt very concerned that, uh, that there was some kind of breakdown among all these various people and advisors for this to get up there to the point of serious consideration. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things. And the other thing too, that I think uh, uh, with the mayor's office, and, and, I, and again, I haven't commented much on the mayor's office since I left there, because I don't go speak out of school when I've been on the team, yeah, but, yeah, but, I, but yeah. I'm honest and upfront. And, and, uh, but the thing that I see is that I just think that there needs to be um, even more collaboration on some issues with community. Okay, I, okay. I think we're doing good on some of the, uh, Department of Justice settlement issues, but some decisions get made, even if they're the right decisions, yeah, sometimes yeah. you need to talk to the community. So one is a good example. You asked me about the new police chief, yes, uh, the new police great. chief, Larry O'Day, someone who I think the world of. I had the opportunity to work with him when he was assistant chief uh, within the bureau, and we worked on diversity issues, uh, training, education, uh, and of everyone on the command staff, he was the most consistent, the most invested in working with people of color, uh, working with women, wanting to see them get opportunities within the Bureau. He's the one who almost single-handedly uh, continued to do a lot of the community policing outreach work that mm. was going on around mm. the city. He kept those advisory groups going. He personally showed up at the meetings. So even before he was considered to be police chief. This was somebody who I saw uh, who was who was who was real. I felt who I think was real and trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So I, for one, and I've said this to a number of people, I think we got the right person for the job. And I think uh, uh, it needed to be someone from inside the bureau with everything going on with the Department of Justice settlement. And I think within the bureau, he was the right person. But the way it was handled and the way it was announced, it made it appear as though there was no collaboration, no input from the community. And so a lot of people in the community said the same thing. Well, wow, we like it. God, wouldn't it have been nice to 
invite us to the table, give us some input. Uh, and, and that's where I think the mayor's office is taking some he uh, heat. Uh, and the same thing happened when I was replaced when I left office. Right, Again, right. it may be the right person, uh, but the process was, no, here's I'll a just, decision. I got, I got to break into that particular point because the, the mayor had selected the right person, an African-American male, a role model, if you will, when you mm -hmm. start talking about the whole issue of African-Americans, that and the other, one who, who's had the kind of a background uh, that would basically would be an impartial, an impartial kind of a, uh, a response and whatever. But the fact of the matter, being able to get the job done mm -hmm. and being able to work with all the various people is a very, is a very, uh, you know, it's a dem very demanding job. And he'd gotten the right person. Unfortunately, you don't have the right person there. Yeah. I'll just be straight up with yeah. you. And well, I, I, want, I can continue on, but I got, we got about another ten minutes, okay. and I want to make sure we spend but, one last minute, one, yeah, one but, other second. But if I may, just to follow yeah, on, on, sure. on, on your comments about the fit. You yeah, know, right. That I very important to the job uh, uh, prior to that opportunity coming up to uh, work in public safety as a policy advisor for the mayor. It wasn't anything I had considered. Uh, yeah, right. I had I've had a very diverse career, as you know, in the yeah, public oh, and yeah. the private sector. Yeah. But when I was approached, I had to really sit down and say, one, can I do this job? And two, do I want to do this? Job? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. one of the things I tell young people is there's oftentimes you'll get offered jobs and you can do them, but you got to make sure that you want to do it. Mm -hmm. So when I sit down and look at in terms terms of the can-do part is everything you said. I just happened to be at the point of my career that I wasn't worried about the next position or the next job. Uh, uh, I was there so I could be candid, I could be straight up, uh, and two, I had a track record of being able to work, as we say here in Portland, on both sides of the river. You can work with the folks downtown and be respected. You can come into the community and be respected. So I was able to walk on both sides of the aisle, or both sides of the river, if you will, uh, had some backgrounds. I I think that was a good fit for the position uh, and I was just very upfront and candid and 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 I believe if you want respect you have to show respect yeah, so yeah, I was yeah. always very respectful with the people I dealt with but very direct and nobody had to question where I was at so it's unfortunate because then everything happened with all the police right. shootings right, the right, Ferguson right, issues right, and all right, of right. that yeah well trust me uh, the mayor's gonna have a have another major issue now because now he's selecting about 15 or 20 people to respond as opposed to having one person respond. Mm -hmm. Or you understand, I mean, the new committee that he's yeah. putting together, that particular structure. Yeah. The, the AMA, i.e., basically represented that issue to get into the table. Mm -hmm. And they basically, I'm sure they didn't say no to your selection mm -hmm. to the mayor, if you will. In fact, mm -hmm. they supported the, the selection. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I want to spend more time. We'll spend some more time on that, but we got about 10 minutes. Okay. And I want us to spend some time. Give us an update on this whole issue with the Roy J issue and whatever. Oh. Where are we on that piece? Okay, yes. Yes. And again, just to provide some context to this, when I came back and reported what had happened uh, with me in this political drive-by, I also reported that there were certain individuals in this community that had just gone out of their way to try to throw dirt on me. Right. And, and, and I started trying to figure out who these people were mm -hmm. and, and what were their motivations. And one of the persons who was in the middle of this, uh, who wasn't even at the event, uh, but was throwing dirt at me, and I started figuring out, well, uh, it was Mr. Roy J. Harris, and I, I concluded, number one, this is a good friend of Loretta. He's a supporter of Loretta's. In fact, I would even digress for a second and say, when people, some people who've asked the question, well, why was Loretta at the reception? Mm -hmm. uh, the reception was held at Quartet Restaurant. Roy J. happened to have been a partner in Quartet Restaurant. He was in the process of suing the partnership <laughs> when this happened. And so there was speculation by folks in the community that uh, Loretta's there was there on a mission for Roy J. Roy mm -hmm. J. was going out of his way at the same time this happened to uh, badmouth the restaurant, to badmouth the the partners, and do everything he could. And 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 people said he's just looking for any dirt he can. And that Loretta was there, uh, who was him. just was there to support him and to find yeah. some dirt. Yeah. So as a result, I also made the statement too. I said that in a political drive by or any drive by if a person survives you got to be willing to deal with consequences and repercussions yes. and I said I wasn't going to personally try to respond to this but I felt like the information that came to me a lot of it was just unmoral unethical behavior but some of it bordered on uh, what appeared to be illegal activities dealing with public resources mm -hmm. and my position very simply was how could anybody in the community receive public resources and then turn around and take shots at the people who are trying to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. And I started to see there was a pattern of behavior uh, that had gone on for years. 
And then as I became vocal about this, more people in the community started coming to me, telling me their stories. And that really made me understand mm -hmm. that this had been going on actually for decades. Mm -hmm. And that's when I said I needed to speak up. So what I did was to take this information and I turned it over to the US Justice Department and said, hey, I'm not an investigator, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a law enforcement officer, but this is wrong. If any of this is true, this is wrong. You guys need to look into this. Mm -hmm. I gave it to the US um, um, Justice Department. They started looking into this. And so here's the update now. What has transpired is this investigation has been handed off to the U. I'm sorry, to the uh, state of Oregon Attorney General's Office and the state of Oregon Department of Justice has picked up the investigation. Um, they have been actively investigating this for oh at least seven or eight months now. Uh, from the information I've heard, they've issued subpoenas in this case. Uh, there's been attorneys hired. Uh, there's been records turned over, financial records, uh, and I think the investigators are doing exactly what we would expect them to do when you've got someone dealing with hundreds of thousands of public sector dollars and uh, we expect to be some accountability and some accounting. You know, was this money used for the intended purpose? Mm -hmm. Where did the money go? Uh, uh, was it properly accounted for? And when you start to look at uh, nonprofits who don't appear to have an active board, they don't appear to have a budget, they don't have minutes of any meetings, uh, they don't have any motions to make decisions, and you start to see a pattern where uh, a single individual running multiple nonprofits. Well, there's something like 40 or so, or something uh, like that. Some outrageous, at least a couple dozen, if yeah, not these, more. Yeah, right, right, and, right. Uh, Gee, that just blew my mind. And no paper trail. And hmm. so I'm sitting here going, well, wait a minute. I'm getting put on blast in the media. I'm getting put on blast because I call it Sister Beautiful and you got somebody out here. And this go back to Malcolm X. Say, if you're not careful, the newspaper will have you <laughs> loving those folks who are oppressing you and hating the ones being oppressed. So I'm getting hated because I'm telling, here's the truth. Here's what's going on. And then conversely, you know, and Mr. Roy J. Harris is, you know, he's running around doing a lot of self-promotion, taking pictures with all these liberal, progressive, gullible white folks and running yeah, yeah. his website. Everybody putting him out there and yeah. he's acting like and telling people he's untouchable. He can do what he wants. And, and he represents the community. And he, and he represents the community. <laughs> and, the black community. And the black community. And white. most folks would say they just tolerate him. Yes, yes. You know, and yeah, so he's running yeah. around. He was doing all this. I gave it to an investigation. So long story short, yeah. the, 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 the U.S. attorney have uh, collaborated with the Oregon Attorney General's Office. They've handed off the information. The Attorney General's Office investigators have been in the lead on this. Uh, and as of the end of the year last year, based on all the information turned over, they brought in another investigator to go through all the paperwork and all the documentations. And we'll see what happens from there. Uh, uh, and, and the other part, too, that this is important for the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office because in the last legislative session uh, there was a House bill that was passed and God, I can't remember the number now 2081 I, I mm -hmm. think was that I'm not positive though okay. but the House bill that was passed was passed by uh, uh, it was carried by three representatives one R and two D's and it was to charge the uh, uh, the Oregon Justice Department with holding charitable institutions more accountable for their reporting and mm. for what they're doing. Mm. And I, whoa, and because of this same concern, people mm. pimping nonprofits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, so the U.S., I'm sorry, the Oregon Attorney General's Office immediately stepped up and they've been actively pursuing this. And Where's I don't, that bill? That that bill is it's it's been passed. It's it, it has been passed. It's, it has been passed. It's active, active. <laughs> and uh, and when I talk to the folks there, they are responding. I say right now, I I think it's a good bill. I think it's doing what it's supposed to do, mm -hmm. and uh, and it goes back to the same thing. Uh, I, again, you know, the positions I've been in with the state of Oregon, the PDC, uh, uh, Providence, and other folks. Uh, I work with a lot of people, and 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 the black folks have loved it. When I go to the school board and I hold folks accountable, and I yeah. go to 
the city council, right. I go to the PDC right. commission, right. and I'm holding people accountable. But some of these black folks, I turn around and look at them and say, well, look, you need to step up, make sure you're doing what you say you're mm. going to do. And then they get mad, you know, and I just feel personally that Roy J. Harris fell into that category. So there'll be more on the right. investigation that's going to come out. Uh, uh, at some point, I'm sure the media, the, the, the mass media will pick up on that. Let yeah. me ask you a question. Uh, you, you said the U.S. Attorney General, I mean, mm -hmm. the U.S., okay? Uh, then, but we, then they gave it to the state, right, Attorney mm -hmm. General, okay? But then, uh, in all due respect, when I, after gone through this governor stuff, some things came out revealing from the standpoint mm -hmm. that the Attorney General, people, a number of people felt that the Attorney General of the state did not jump on this Kitzhopper thing before the election. Mm -hmm. And one of the rationale was that, and I, and I understand, I know, that the, the 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 husband of the attorney general just happened to be the publisher of the Willamette Week. You're correct. Okay, yes, you are correct. So then I start thinking about your particular situation, mm -hmm. and I'm just saying, well, now who was able to lobby? Now this piece about well, the defense gives it to the state. Are they going to be overviewing this thing as far as the, well, the feds are concerned? Well, uh, what's that all about? Well, the thing that I understand, because no due respect, one other little piece I want to throw mm -hmm. in there. You know, when I start thinking about the feds. You know, Roy J has tentacles all over the place. Aspect mm -hmm. of it, I'm, I'm, and I, 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 and I'm not trying to get personal with it, but I think about Senator Wyden. Mm -hmm. You know, Loretta was really mm -hmm. his his uh, supporter, if you will, mm -hmm. in, in this whole piece about her running for office. Hey, okay, fine, but again, he's on the federal level, mm -hmm. and it's easy well, for him to pick up the phone mm -hmm. and say, "Hey, well, let's let, let me talk about this piece," and oh, it's nothing or something of that yeah. nature or something. Well, I'm well, not trying well, to bring this issue yeah, up. But well, I mean, a couple of thoughts. We got about two minutes. Yeah, a couple on. of thoughts I share with you. Number one is that, uh, uh, as I understand it, the, the, the again the Justice Department they were going to investigate tax fraud. That's okay. what they were looking at. Okay. The Oregon folks are looking at nonprofit fraud. Okay. And in this case, based on some of the allegations made, it fit more into their belly wig. And okay. so it was a matter of, I guess, discussion. They said, "Well, you guys take the lead on this." And the other thing, uh, some folks here locally may have seen that there were two people convicted. Of nonprofit fraud mm -hmm. recently, mm -hmm. uh, two deal. two women yes. and uh, they African American, both received, African -American yes. and they both received some jail time, one two and a half years, one three years. And I found out the same people who are investigating, uh, and it's actually not an investigation of Roy J per se. It's an investigation mm -hmm. of Project Clean Slate and mm -hmm. the African American Chamber. Mm -hmm. And Roy happens to be the linkage for both of those. So mm -hmm. they're looking at both of those organizations. Mm -hmm. And the people who are doing the investigations are the same folks who investigated. Mm -hmm. This other situation mm -hmm. that came up that mm -hmm. resulted in some folks being prosecuted. Mm -hmm. And I'm not hating on anybody to hate to see anybody get something like that right, thrown right, at them. Right, but right. I do expect folks to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. And you, you can't go around uh, uh, taking money and then uh, attacking folks when they call you on the carpet. Please. I heard that. I heard. You know, hey, this has been a pleasure. Trust me. This, is, this has been my Black History Month. And hopefully, you know, the whole idea is that mine is to is to inform and educate, and I think it's very, very important. It's not about personal, it's just basically what's what's going on in our environment. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been doing today. We've been talking about that piece today. And I want to thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Ruti, and um, this has been very inspiring, and, and hopefully you guys will uh, pass this on to your, your neighbors and whatever. Too often we tend not to read the papers and get into the news aspect of it, but this is a very important piece. Got me? Very thank important. You. We can't be forgetting about that. Yes. And thank you for giving us that opportunity because it'll, it'll hopefully improve the community. And that's really what you, I know that's what you're trying to do. Yes, and okay, thank again. you too. And Appreciate thank you very much for that. Okay, right. folks, there you go. Black History Month. Enjoy it. Go out there and spend some time and recognize your neighbor, okay? Or uh, educate your neighbor who happened to be maybe not a black, but another American who happens to be white. Talk about the issues. Have a good one. I'll see you next week. Take care.